as Mahesh says, working with Indigenous Australians in both New South Wales and in this urban area in Sydney more recently, and in the centre of Australia, in uh, around the, the, the Red Centre at uh, Ernabella. And I've worked with a number of inquiries, and in all of those, Indigenous peoples have consistently um, been concerned about changing environments. Now, if I'm looking in this area here, what I'm going to be looking at is this urban area, which is where I came from. It's the Georges River, and I'll show it to you now. Um, and the point that I want to make is that it's in a temperate area. One of the other areas I've worked in has been Indian history and the connections between India and Australia. And I'm very aware of how mangroves figure so largely in um, discussions about the coastal environment of India. But what I wanted to point out with that little map is that the coastal environment in temperate areas is where this story is located. And in temperate zones, mangroves act quite differently than they do in tropical zones. In tropical zones, there are substantial stands, there are forests of mangroves, um, threatened as they are, and with a whole lot of controversies and, uh, and narratives that, that you all know better than me. But on the coast of Australia, in the temperate zone where I come from, which is that arrow is pointing to Sydney, it looks rather different. So this is what Sydney looks like from the air. Um, it's actually built on a series of big rivers. Those of you who've been there will recognise this, um, this projection into Botany Bay, which is the airport. Um, this big bay here is called, it's called Stingray in the local language, which is what it looks like. The Georges River, these are rivers which are um, sunken river valleys. So they begin as freshwater rivers down here and they flow north and have a big bend out here and then flow east to the coast. And that's what the Georges River does. The area I'm going to be looking at is this area just, just before you get to Botany Bay, that big stingray area. This is saline, it's tidal. And the mangroves, as you can see, are just in the, those green areas. They're not in enormous forests. They're just in those areas where freshwater rivers are tributaries. They come down to the saline river, but they're tidal in their lower regions. So these are protected, quiet, tidal waters. And that's where you find mangroves. Now the predominant, um, unlike India, again, where you have many different species of mangroves, in Australia, in the temperate areas, you've really mainly got two. Avicennia marina is the main one. Um, and there's another one called Agicarus corniculatum, um, which it's lucky that I don't have to say that very often, but it's not very common. It's a plant which is more tolerant of fresh water. The grey mangroves are the ones which we see most of, and they're the ones that most of this story is about. And you can see they've got characteristic peg roots that come up. They trap detritus leaves and things like that, and they, they enable those, um, that detritus to decompose in an anaerobic environment where the, the roots are drawing oxygen into the tree but the, um, and, and to, the, um, to, the, to the stuff that's around the roots. It provides food for the tree and food for um, a whole body of other species that are around. So those pig roots are very important they're quite characteristic. They're also forbidding for human populations. But mangroves in Australia in the temperate zones are never alone. They have always been in interaction and often tension with salt marsh, which is there. And you can see that's about as bright and startling and striking visually as salt marsh gets in the northern reaches where I, am, where I live in Sydney. It doesn't get much more dramatically floral than that. If you go south, unlike most species, salt marsh becomes more diverse. Um, it's, it's composed of reeds and grasses and floral plants, but the flowers get brighter and it becomes much more visible, much more obvious, down in Tasmania or the southern areas of New Zealand. So what you see along the Georges River is this. 
And if you look at it, what you see is the water. This is waterlogged land, and it's saline, it's salt. And it's not just plants. There's lots of, as I said, creatures that are there. Um, this one is the tracks of the swamp wallaby. And the swamp wallaby is important because it's one of the creatures which feeds on um, mangrove shoots, mangrove seedlings. So it's, it's one of the ways, not only does it find its own food in this, this interacting zone, but it also manages the expansion and contraction of the mangroves by favouring mangrove seedlings as, uh, as its food, mangrove shoots, rather than salt marsh. And there are other things which change that balance. So the borders between the mangroves and the salt marsh have always been very clear, but they're not static. It's not stable. At times, the mangroves have retreated and the salt marsh has expanded, and at other times, the mangroves have expanded and the salt marsh has retreated. So that's the environment that was around the, uh, the rivers. Um, it, it continues in some areas. These photographs have been taken quite recently in some of the areas that I know, but not in many other areas. Now, when the British settlers arrived, this is where we get to live with you. When the British settlers arrived, they brought with them a lot of fears about marshy land. And you'll know that. So a lot of ideas which persist to this day. In England, where you have marshy land and you have decomposition occurring, you often get hydrogen and other you get a shimmering effect and you get things like marsh lights, fen lights, which are thought to be supernatural beings. That has expanded in the popular imagination. This is a diagram from a, from a um, uh, it's actually from a PlayStation type game at the moment, but there's a whole lot of these things around and you'll recognise them. Marshy land, waterlogged land, is, is thought to be unnatural. And for many centuries in, in England and in Europe, where the settlers came from, to Australia, the marshland was thought to be the abode of unnatural creatures, which might be quite benign looking on the surface, like this one is, but underneath it's malevolent and dangerous. Now that body of ideas came with the early European settlers, the British landed in 1788, um, with a whole bunch of people, many of whom you know were involuntary migrants, they were transported um, most of them were people forced off their lands in Ireland or Scotland, uh, dispossessed, came to the cities and criminalised um, for various reasons in the cities, in jail, but not executed, they were transported instead and came to Australia. So that's the basis of the population, including my family. So these were the sorts of ideas and myths and legends that came from Europe and Britain and, and Ireland and stayed within the families but they were reinforced by the medicine from the 16th century onwards. The ideas that the fumes, that smell you get from rotting and decomposing material was dangerous, became an established part of European medicine. Uh, this is a photograph from the United States uh, from the Civil War, and it's suggesting that the miasma uh, from the swamps is going to be, uh, is going to be lethal to both the, the, the vanquished and the victors, so that it's a public health issue to consider warfare. This is a costume which looks pretty bizarre and legendary in itself, but it's a costume from the 16th century of a plague doctor who is working on this, this miasma theory that the plague is carried in what were called germs that float in the air, that come from these sort of fetid smelly environments like swamps. Swamps are known to be dangerous sources of this sort of infection. And that beak projection is stuffed with, um, with herbs which are sweet smelling and which are thought to filter out the dangerous germs. So it's not intended to look like a scary bird, it's intended to protect the breathing apparatus of the doctor who goes out there. So this sort of thing was not only very long established, but supported by the best, I mean, the most recent scientific opinion up till really the beginning of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. So it's very, um, it's, it's really the invention, the, the uh, discovery of, um, uh, by uh, Marie Curie and um, before that rather, I should say, um, by the people who were exploring the ways that, um, that, that organisms transmitted illness. Uh, that you began to see 
a disturbance of this sort of theory of medicine. The other important thing to know about these areas is that all of this land was granted away. When the British arrived in Australia, they planted a flag, claimed Australia as uh, freehold land, and the, the governors granted a huge amount, particularly riverside areas, as private land to, to lots of people, people in the army, um, anybody who wasn't a convict basically would get a bit of land. But this land, along saline rivers, with sandstone sandy soils couldn't be cultivated, it wasn't actually good farming land. And so this land remained public land, it was de facto commons, even though it was private land. And that's not dissimilar, in fact, although it's a distinct case, but it's not dissimilar to other watercourses in Australia. Because the law in Australia up until 1995 was that you couldn't privately own riverbanks and you couldn't stop people getting to water anywhere in the country. And so um, riverbanks were accessible and because they were muddy and boggy and steep, they were often places which remained an important living area for Aboriginal people, even as the rest of their area was closed down. Now the reason I'm showing you these, these are Defence Force aerial photographs which we began, began in 1930 and took place across the whole of Australia. There's strip photographs um, every year. The Army, the Air Force flew planes across and took these photos. What they show you in, um, when they're expanded like this is that there are tracks all through these sandstones. So this is private land and it's not arable, but it's used extensively. So the people all the way along the river um, who might have trades, they were often labourers, this is a working class river, and there's agriculture further back off the river where there's shale based soils. But down here, they're doing all sorts of things. They're hiding smuggled goods if they're working on the, on the wards, they're meeting for illicit sex, they're hunting, hunting swamp wallabies and other things, um, they're going down to fishing sites, there's all sorts of things going on and they're often things that nobody's supposed to know about, they're separate things. However, these areas are very widely used, and so the sandstones and the riverbanks are remain important areas, even though they're uh, even though they're private land. Now, oral history, just to mention as I go along, a lot of the information that I'm talking to you about comes from geographers and people who've looked at the soil, the geologists, um, and it's come from um, geographers, particularly who've looked at water level, sea level rises over many centuries, but it's also come from oral history. And so we can put all those sources together. Oral history is one of the tools that we use. Now, this land remained, these riverbanks, an Aboriginal place. There are Aboriginal communities there who go, who, who continue to live along those riverbanks until the 1940s and 50s at least. And then <coughs> even though they're forcibly moved away, um, Joe Anderson there, who's taken his grandfather's name, is, is insisting that, that they should be allowed to stay in the face of an attempt to move them on. Um, but I've actually interviewed a number of the people who were little kids in that photographs, photograph and talked to them about what it was like living on the river and what it was like being under pressure of removal. But they were there because the banks were clear. You can see they're pretty accessible, the water's accessible. They fished um, and lived close to the edge of the water and it was a sustainable place in which Aboriginal people could maintain communities, work for the cash economy, as well as continuing to teach kids about the ways to use plants and animals for medicinal purposes and, and the cultural knowledge that went with rivers. Now it wasn't only, it wasn't only Aboriginal people, as I've said, you can tell from those tracks, who were using and appreciating these places. They're often marshy. This is a picture here of Kelso Swamp, 1951, which is sort of in that sort of western edge of that middle stretch that I was showing you. Um, and in the early 1950s, it's still a swamp and it's being described in that way um, by uh, Zena Laundes, who was interviewed, and her story is uh, published in a little local history, which is one of the places you can look good oral histories. 
and the local historical society has got that picture of people on the banks. They've got a pile of wood there. They haven't chopped down mangroves. You can see the mangroves are just on the point. This is a, an open river bank. They're building a jetty. They use the water. They have rowboats and they have regattas. So that's where we're up to 1950. But what else is going on? And this is for historians and sociologists. We need to think not just about the biology and the geology, but about the social and political processes that are happening. This is a period when class is becoming more evident as a divider in Australian society, where previously you had the convicts and the guards. Um, that has now emerged by the early years, the interwar years, you've got a, ri a, a rising middle class who are aspirational and looking to establish property and professional lives for themselves, and you've got a growing fear of working class populations. And that's expressed in terms of this pseudo-psychology about bodgies and widgies and juvenile delinquency, which is aimed at working class kids particularly young men. So this is circulated, it's actually a description, you can tell by your clothes, who's the bodgy and the witty. Um, and it's, uh, this is a, a 1951 issue of a newspaper. It's very widely believed mythology. We're sort of moving on from the miasma stuff and getting to this. So this is circulating particularly about the areas on the Georges River. And that's partly because what you've got is a decision with World War II to industrialise Australia. The Japanese not only came very close to India, they came very close to Australia. There was uh, Japanese submarines in, in these Australian harbours. Um, there was a very grave fear of invasion. There had always been a very racist anxiety about Asia. And that compounded itself to a set of government decisions about increasing industry, and that means increasing population to work in industry. Um, it was also a planned city. All of this area, for environmental historians, not just the green areas close to the rivers, but the brown area was all supposed to be a green belt. A whole lot was going to be conserved. This was a really major characteristic element of, of uh, the County of Cumberland plan, which was established to plan this most planned expansion of the city. It was going to ensure that factories were spread around and that there was a, a, a green belt that stayed around the city. However, it didn't work out like that, did it? Because... What's the white belt? The white belt on the city? Um, sorry, I'll just go... The, the white yeah. here, yeah. that's actually an area which is... Um, it's got special uses, but it's actually a highland area down there. You're moving down into quite rugged highland, which becomes difficult to do any of the things which had been planned. It, like the green areas, was going to remain un, untouched, but partly it was going to be special uses because it was going to be a catchment area for drinking water. Because if you think about it, if you greatly increase the population, you have to think about where the water's coming from. You've got saline rivers here by the time they get to the coast. This is a long geological story, which I won't go into. But how do you get fresh water to, to give all those people something to drink, as well as to do the building you want to do to create this new city? You have to build dams. And that area was going to be a catchment for a series of big dams, which were to the south, and the headwaters of those rivers that have flowed from the south to the north. So, so much for this plan. It met the aspirational groups that I said were along these, uh, a number of rivers, including this working class river. They wanted subdivisions, they wanted new, um, you know, building, uh, people to pay rates to local governments, but also they, they were happy to have the factories. They were unlike the, um, the more affluent and powerful middle classes in the northern half of the city who could block the zoning so that their areas were blocked off as residential only. And the, the attempts by working class local governments along that river to have 
areas blocked off as residential only failed at state government level, which meant that all of the factories and all of the hostels for the working class workers who had to work in the factories all went along the Georges River. And none of them were sewered. None of them had, um, had any infrastructure to collect human waste or industrial waste from the, the great expansion of the industrial world there. Now, what, what the local communities feared along the river was that they would lose access for those boating and picnic and, and, and social things. So this is a, an issue about sociality, and I think anthropologists have got lots of work to do in urban working class areas where the 19th century, there was histories of both commercial and non-commercial social gatherings. Um, working class people in these areas, like George Jacobson here, who's the father of one of the rock and roll pop stars who was my icon, and I'm really sure to talk to Cole Joy when I was 16. I went and interviewed him when I was just a few years ago. I had a lovely time, lovely man. This is his father who was very, very active in this movement which tried to save the poor shores, tried to stop them being subdivided and turned into factories, pouring junk into the water, poison, toxins, and having hostels which poured sewage into the water. Um, these these, were, these organisations were independently funded, they had to fund themselves. So one of the things they did was deals with the local government to be the sort of managers of this land. So they got the royalties from dredging. Dredging could be used for building. And so dredging was a way to fund the improvements they wanted to make. And they wanted, they were actually worried about their kids. They too were worried about juvenile delinquency and they were terrified that their working class kids were going to turn into juvenile delinquents. So they wanted both recreational areas and bushland for them to walk in and they wanted access to the rivers. They didn't want the riverbanks to be privatised. And some of them, like George, were worried about their children. Um, and they were worried also about the bush. And it seemed to George and other people like him that Keeping the bush, keeping the mangroves was going to be a way for his kids to understand the bush, to get exercise, to be a part of engaging with the nature of the area. Where there was other people, um, and Pat was one of the women I interviewed, who was becoming anxious that the mangroves were expanding, which wasn't really well understood at that stage, but she began, she and other people were concerned about it, and they weren't concerned about chopping them down. So, this, this group campaigned throughout the 50s and they won. They got their, they got their national park, it was called. Uh, and I've written about this. Um, it's called the People's National Park. They had an idea of a national park, which was very different to the way um, state-based national, park, national parks organisations and environmental departments now see a national park as being that conserving nature. They saw it as being a place for the people, the nation and they were the people, working class people, and they wanted access to it for these two different reasons, as I said. The blue arrows just show you which way the river flows at this point. So it's come up from the south, made a big bend, and is flowing east. And that black part is all the way along the river, but you can see that big white square in the middle of the black part? That was uh, a big square that got uh, refused to them from a private property because it was made into an electricity substation as part of this subdivision process that was going on. So at this stage, it's just the local community, local working class people, and the, um, uh, the local governments advising them. But um, that's the, the, this is the way they see it. They think they've won, but there is conflict in the committee, conflict about whether or not they should be bulldozing mangroves, whether or not they should be expanding recreational areas, how much of the bush they should keep. So there's a lot of debate and conflict going <coughs> on in there. What else is happening? The mangroves. The mangroves are expanding. Oh. Um, so this, um, at the same time, you've got all those people coming into the river to work in the factories, and sewage um, is, is human waste is pouring into the river as well dramatically increased 
between 1945 through to 55 and 65. Um, and that leads to an increase in the mangroves. Now, here is where it's important to be talking to biologists because you have to think about what's actually happening. Why is that human waste, which is a fertiliser, why is that increasing the mangroves? Why does it increase other plants along the river? Well, one of the things that's happening is that it's increasing, and you can see how the mangroves are increasing. That's the, the, the black area are the mangrove stands along Salt Plain Creek, which is one of the, the largest of the uh, tributaries running from north to south into the river. Um, why are they expanding? They're expanding because there's been um, clearing upriver in the shale areas and that's that's lowered the that's lowered the depth of the river and so the mangroves are expanding seaward. But because the fertilizer is increasing their growth, their root base is growing. It's heightening the ground level and it's obstructing the water getting to the salt marsh. So the salt marsh is retreating and the mangroves are expanding. Just like they've done on other occasions in the past. But they're actually expanding in both directions into the water and across the land. And what they're expanding across is the salt marsh. And so what you get in the 1960s is much more of the attitude that we saw from just one or two of the Regatta Association, the campaigners in the 50s. People hated mangroves. More and more people are starting to revert to those old ideas about mangroves being sources of danger, sources of disease, they stank, they really stank badly. And that's because not only were they doing their job properly, collecting leaves and other things, but they were doing their job even better by collecting the human waste and sewage that was in the river, in those peg roots. So they were just doing a really good job and it made them smell even worse. Lots of people hated them and it was very easy to believe that they were causing illnesses. The council workers themselves would be sent by the councils to dig out mangroves as a punishment. It was seen as hard labour and as a punishment. So it's a general sense that mangroves are not only dangerous, but they're a punishment. They're hard, terrible plants to get rid of. The only thing to be done with them is to dig them out. So it gave full licence to all of those fears. Very quickly, at the same time, you've got a massive increase, what the health inspectors call an explosion of garbage because the economy has changed. Not only has the factory in the level increased, the population has increased, but the whole economy has shifted and you in India and people in China are facing this issue too, which is an issue about the massive amount of packaging which comes with that expansion in the consumer economy. That way of approaching economy, changing economy, developing industrialisation, expanding cash economy, and the, the, the role of consumption. The packaging industry is expanding and it's making its money by wrapping stuff up which is thrown away. The health inspectors at Bankstown closed the river to swimming in 1962 and they plead with the local government and the state government to take some concerted action about solid wastes, both human waste and sewage and other solid waste, all this packaging. It's just building up like this. I passed a place on the way up here today which looks just like this. Um, and one of the reasons is that Australia and other countries are exporting their waste. China has now refused to take it. Malaysia is beginning to refuse but there's local groups in Malaysia that are struggling to stop countries like Australia sending them their waste. But in the beginning, in, in the 1950s, what was done with it was that it was um, it combined with the stuff that's coming from the factories and there's a nuclear reactor for experimental purposes, also set up on the Georges River for the same reason at Lucas Heights on the southern side, that the local, the local councils couldn't stop it. Um, so what happens is that the council decides that they will bury the waste by infilling the, um, the little bays along the Georges River. And they're going to do that because they're going to make soccer grounds. They're not going to make soccer grounds. They're going to make football grounds and cricket pitches because that's what will stop these wicked working class boys turning into juvenile delinquents. So it's very tied up 
with this fear of working class people, the idea that the sport will discipline people into being good citizens and that we can get rid of all this garbage with these sanitary infills and sanitary infilling, if you read Pelosi, is, um, is, is thought to be the ideal way to get rid of garbage. Not very sanitary if it's on the edge of a river, but nevertheless. Um, so you infill, you can see what's been done in that bay, it's been infilled and turned into a sports field, a sporting ground. And this begins to happen all the way along. But what happens just to bring it to the, the conclusion, which um, some people have already got to, there is a local fight back now after all that conflict in the early regatta association to get the national park, which has been taken away from them because it's, the river's too damaged and polluted, it's not regarded as properly pristine anymore. So they're now just left with sports fields. Um, residents begin to oppose these plans to, to reclaim um, and to infill the little bays and to do it by digging up the mangroves. So there's a number of movements that begin all of the early 1970s, which are about challenging the council's right to dig up mangroves and to fill in these spaces and to turn them into sports fields. People are saying they don't want sports fields, they want picnic grounds, but they want the bush. They want the bush to stay the same. And what they talk about is saving the mangroves, is what they talk about. Now, why did that change? Why did that shift from hating mangroves to people wanting to save them, even a proportion of the population? Now, what I'm suggesting here, and from the historical evidence and the oral evidence particularly, is that there had been that sense among some people, the George Jacobsons and others, that they wanted to keep the natural environment. And some other people, like Ruth Staples, were, were seeking that space for picnics. They didn't want flat playing fields and disciplined sports. They wanted picnic grounds where people could choose their own networking and, and be with family. Um, but the other source, I think, which is important to know for all of us, is that the other reason this changed was because there was a set of new ideas that were emerging. And all of the input that is coming in in those late 1950s and, the, and through the 1960s into the local groups involves people from New South Wales Fisheries and others, biologists, people who are beginning the process of looking not just at species but at habitats, who are starting to study a new discipline called ecology. And one of the health inspectors at Bankstown is doing that, for example. And they're talking at little local meetings. They're doing the heroic work of going out at 7 o'clock at night and preparing a little 10 minute talk with demonstrations, taking people on little field trips. So the biologists are important, particularly in New South Wales fisheries. Now that's interesting because this is led by Don Francois, who's a Canadian, who introduces trout for recreational fishing into New South Wales rivers. Trout are not endemic species, they're an exotic species. So people who are wedded to the idea of the romance of the native found him very problematic. But he was very interested in habitat. He was interested in a relationship between plants, animals, birds, creatures, environments. And it was under him that this very activist role of New South Wales fisheries emerged and these ideas of ecology were also emerging into what was called nature study in schools. Australia didn't have the tradition of bird watching, which many of you have taken part in, which I know is really big in India. It's not really so big in Australia, but nature study is, and, and in a range of different ways, there's, there's an influence from nature study. And the, the final impact was that the um, there had been recent struggles to try and save some of the areas in Tasmania, like Lake Peter. Failed campaigns, but very powerful, leaving a very strong determination to win the next one. So Lake Peter is one that you might hear about. Um, but what's important, I think, from my point of view, is that none of the oral histories, none of the newspaper articles, none of the pamphlets talk about salt marsh. They all talk about mangroves. 
you cannot, but you barely find, sometimes you see salt marsh and small print down the bottom, but that's all. Um, instead, what you get is a new narrative about mangroves. Instead of the stinking mangroves that produce the smell, what you get is something which builds on the ecology. So it's drawing in all those little talks from the biologists. It's drawing in the actual ecology, but it's ignoring most of it. It's not looking at the competition between mangroves and salt marsh. It's not looking at a whole lot of dimensions of the story, but what it has picked up is the idea that mangroves are the nurturing protectors of little fish, baby fish. So, and, and of other small species in those, among those pig roots, around, among the roots. So the fact that the salt marsh may have been doing that too is, is ignored. The mangroves had become invasive and big and green and they were visible. From the oral history, I would say that people simply were not seeing the salt marsh. They did not see it. They saw the mangroves. The mangroves, in fact, were affecting the way people saw that whole area because of the way they were responding to this changed environment with higher fertiliser levels, lower um, beds or raised beds of the rivers, and um, the sorts of impacts that are coming from this higher fertiliser base are all fostering um, the mangroves. They are responding, and it's that expansion that is being seen by local people, and that's what they focus on. Saving the mangroves becomes the narrative which people address. And that's the way the victory occurs um, by, the, um, by the late 1970s, in fact, the mid-70s, you've got governments setting aside areas that they call mangroves, mangrove reserves. The focus now is entirely on the mangroves. Um, and the salt marsh is still there, but nobody sees it. Um, the salt marsh is still there. This is one of the very few places where there's an expansive salt marsh. In most places, the mangroves have overtaken the salt marsh and there's only a little bit of it left. But it's not thought to be important. And it's actually um, interesting to look at the points where scientific investigation begins. Scientific investigation of mangroves in these temperate zones in Australia begins in the 1970s which is pretty interesting, because this, suddenly, you've got a very big interest in mangroves. There is no scientific investigation of salt marsh. Absolutely none. The scientists are, in fact, taking their lead from the political ferment that is going on around them. By the 1990s, you begin to get some rising interest among local governments about salt marsh, and that interacts with all prompts, the very beginnings, of scientific research into salt marsh, so the 1990s. Now, they're, they're not accidents, those dates. They relate to the social and political events that are occurring. So as environmental studies scholars and researchers and as environmental historians, you need to look at both. You need to be thinking about all of the range of disciplines that are going to give you tools to work on what you want to find out about. And what you have to think about is where you're going. What, what are the questions you want and where are you going to get answers for them? And I just point from this story to the fact that the mangroves actually have agency. They are not, they are not static. They are not doing something pristine at all. They are changing. They're responding to very different developmental circumstances. They're being expansive. They're being invasive. They're endemic, but they're invasive. They're not exotic, but they're invasive. They are damaging the environment around them, but they're really big and people see them. And they become a symbol. But they become a symbol because the story can be changed into a story which makes sense for people. The nurturing maternal, in fact, mangroves become the way the story is told, rather than the dangerous, um, uh, odiferous, uh, dark, nasty mangroves. So the mangroves themselves have agency in this. The role of the biologist is really important, I think, and we need to recognise that for all of us who sometimes think we're too tired to go out and give that one little 10-minute talk to that little local government organisation, 
you have to do it because these are the things that build changes. These are the things which allow people the information that they need, but they are not necessarily going to take up everything that's said, but what they will do is craft that into a narrative which will make sense for a campaign. And that's what the, the nurturing, um, the saviour, the nurturing and maternal mangroves offer. They offer an icon which worked for people, to motivate people to protect that area. We need to be cautious about natives. In Australia today, there's an enormous amount of romancing of native species, which are thought to be good all the time and to be unchanging, and we just have to protect them and bring them back, without thinking about habitats and interactions. And the, the lesson from this, I think, is that mangroves continue to be very problematic. And so the most up-to-date approach to, to managing the mangrove salt marsh complex, now that salt marsh has finally been recognised, is to prune the mangroves, to, to limit their growth, to ensure that there is um, an active interaction and not a dominance of one species over another. Caution about natives is so my last conclusion, but that's where I'll stop. And you may find that there's at least some parallels with your circumstances in India. And if not, then you've got a sense of where temperate mangroves are going. Thank you.